and welcome to Keyframes and Cardboard Props, a look inside God of War's cinematic process. My name is Erica Pinto, and I'm the lead narrative animator at Santa Monica Studio. Today, I'm going to talk about everything that went into the creation of the scenes like the one I'm about to show you. Of course, just a heads up, there are spoilers for God of War ahead, so if you haven't played the game, I don't know if you want to leave or just let it be spoiled. It is time, my son. Look around at what you have done. Let's give it up for our cinematics team. Man, they worked hard on that. <laughs> All right, so at the beginning of this project, our creative director, Corey Barlock, came to the cinematics team and said, I have a vision. I want to create a seamless, immersive player experience, and I want to do it with a camera that never cuts, not anywhere in a cinematic, not between gameplay and cinematic, never. So our question was, how do we do that? I'm going to tell you how we did that, and I'm going to do it step by step using the scene I just showed you, which we lovingly called the flying boat jump. So named because Kratos and Atreus jump off of a giant flying boat. This is one of the most complex scenes in God of War, running the gamut of our entire production pipeline, so I'm going to be referring back to it throughout our presentation. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the people involved in creating a cinematic. At the top of our hierarchy, of course, we've got our creative director, who provided the overarching vision of the story and oversaw the broad strokes of the cinematic production process. We had our writers, Matt Sophos and Rich Gaubert, who would present the director's vision in the form of scripts. Our director of photography, Doria Razi, who, who designed the detailed plan for executing that vision, scene by scene with a consistent cinematic language. And was the rest of our team, such as our animation director, Bruno, who provided the context for our character acting choices and would give feedback on the animation quality. Myself, the animation lead, responsible for the day-to-day -day production process and ensuring the animators had everything they needed to work to the best of their abilities, also providing feedback. All of our animators, several of which aren't in this photo, sadly, but they were expected to maintain a certain level of self-autonomy with ownership of their assigned scenes from start to finish. They would work very closely with our cinematic artist, who would wrangle the cameras, and they would send all of that data over to our integration team to put the scenes into the game engine. And of course, we can't forget our support staff, such as our producers and our outsource coordinator who made sure everything was running smoothly and getting done on time. I'd like to break down uh, our production into three main phases where we were able to streamline our, streamline our workflow for no-cut cinematics. Pre-visualization, or pre for short, everything we did on set at the mocap stage, and scene assembly and polish of all of that data. So let's start with pre-visualization. And if you see the picture in the background, you might get a little hint of where we went there. Well, let's start with a little history. On previous God of War projects, all of our layout was done in Maya. 
This is all right. Our camera language was pretty simple. We really only had one main rule, which was to keep the camera alive. So we didn't have any static shots. You can see it might move to follow Kratos' gaze. It might push in a little bit to focus on his daughter as we come into the scene. We would use cuts to show details and character reactions. But there wasn't much attention paid to lens choice or anything. This was pretty passable, but we realized this method did not work with no cuts. Here's a very early test scene from this current project, and I'm gonna kinda rip it apart and talk about the failure points. This is my scene, so I can do that. <clears throat> so, we could see, first of all, the characters tended to freeze in place. Uh, we didn't really know what to do with them, and that forced the camera to swing around and traver traverse great distances without really any motivation to do so. I was trying to get reaction shots on their faces as they talked to each other, but again, since I froze them in place, I didn't really know what to do with the camera, so it would move around kind of awkwardly. It wasn't really grounded the way a real camera person would behave. If you look at the start of the scene, you could see that the camera is just way too high. A person would have to be floating in the air in order to get that shot, and then it very quickly swings around and starts going backwards across an entire field. And it was also just a very time-consuming process for something that didn't yield very great results. What we really needed was someone with experience in staging who could help us tackle wonners in a more sophisticated way. So that's when we hired Dori Arazi. And with Dori on board, we began to think about staging our scenes as a complex dance between actors and the camera. We would often use top-down diagrams to plan the scenes. Most of the time this was just done on a whiteboard with some markers, but here I've, I've cleaned it up a little bit for you guys. So you can see here's our camera. The red dot represents Kratos and he's carrying a boar. The green dot over here is Atreus, and the blue dot is Freya, and they're all going inside their giant turtle house. So let me go ahead and play this scene for you. Hello, if my laptop would cooperate. Hang on just a second. Come on, don't break on me. <laughs> Place him on the stave there. You can see the camera follows Kratos Keep him in still. and parks behind him as Freya goes up to her shelf. Atreus comes in from screen you right. Want it's better this way. Yeah, my father doesn't like people either. Boy. Well, you don't. Freya comes him back still to meet before them, he hurts himself. And Atreus kind of moves off to one side Good. and stays out of the way. And you'll notice that the camera is constantly doing minor little movements Rest to shift now. the focus from one character to another. I need two more things. Fresh red root growth just behind the house. Can you pull a cluster? You'll see Atreus will go off screen and then the camera moves the parts behind them again to let Freya and Kratos have their little heart to heart I... moment. I know you're a god. Not of this realm, but there's no mistaking it. He doesn't know, does he? About your true nature, or his own? That is none of your concern. Get up, you'll see the gods of these realms don't take left, kindly to outsiders, to trust right, me. As they go and move I up know. Shelves. When they find you, and they will, they'll make things difficult. And then for you film the lovers out there, this answers. is our little homage to Citizen Kane. Problem. Whatever you're hiding, you cannot protect you him forever. Brought Atreus into the back, but kept him in focus. But you're right. Doesn't concern me. Now, if that staging diagram got a little crazy and looked a bit like spaghetti, that's because, well, staging a wonder is very complicated. All right, so we had our diagrams and our staging ready, but how do we actually create the previs? Well, animators might recognize this sort of thing. <clears throat> we often shoot reference to see how our body mechanics work and get a sense of timing. Most often, we just set a camera down somewhere and shoot ourselves. This was Sophie Evans getting some cool Kratos motion. And this works great for our gameplay animators. They use it to you know, figure out new moves. And the cinematics team was wondering, well, how could we leverage that for our cinematics? Could we take the camera off the tripod and start shooting scenes with it? Yes, you can. Some of the benefits of this were we could easily test different styles of camera, and Dory wanted to try a documentary style, you know, more grounded and, and using handheld. It took very little setup time. You could just grab an SLR, grab a couple animators, go outside and shoot. It was very quick to review. We could shoot in a couple hours, do a review with Corey, and do reshoots within the same day. 
you would get a lot of surprising human interactions just riffing off each other from take to take that you might not think about when you were sitting at a camera at, a, at the computer doing layout in Maya. Plus, it's just a lot of fun. You know, you get out of your chair, you get a little exercise, you look a little ridiculous, you confuse all your neighbors around you, and it's pretty awesome. Some of the challenges, of course, are memorizing lots of lines. We had several very chatty characters in this game, plus learning that complex choreography I just showed you, and since we had no cuts, the animators had to keep all of that in mind while we were shooting at once. What we were trying to do is establish accurate timing for the camera to figure out how much time was needed to transition from composition to composition. And we also had to figure out how we were going to deal with characters of differing sizes. You know, we had little Atreus, and we had some dwarves, and then we had normal-sized humans, we had super-sized humans, we had orcs and trolls and, and dragons and everything. How are we going to do that? And finally, how would the principal cast react to our acting? I mean, we're not professional actors, we're just animators, and would they be influenced by our previews? Let me show you some videos of that live-action reference. Let's see the damage. In relation Let's to see the, the damage. Stuff in game. You can see as our solution for the characters of differing sizes, we tended to just have the animators walking around on their knees. They're the dwarf characters. This helped us get accurate eye lines and compositions for the camera. For this scene, we needed to shoot a vista, and we happened to have a handy little overlook on our balcony down to the dev team floor. Never been this close to the mountain before. Thank you. <laughs> One of the disadvantages of walking on your knees is you don't get a good sense of accurate timing for how long it takes to move around. You can see our animator Mike there kind of shuffling, but our principal cast was able to walk around freely, so you can see Cinder was a lot more active. The dragon was in our path, that is all. I just love that. That's that so cool. <laughs> this was one of our earliest tests when we had extra time, so we went out of our way to build a giant ogre. Our animation director got in on the fun. But even then, we were still trying to get some real work done, and Dory wanted to test this camera move where he kind of snuck in between us, and then we parked in front of him, and it worked out pretty well. So let's take a look at the live action reference for the flying boat jump. Action. You can see we had a prop, just a tripod. Originally, we were going to start the scene with some kind of a lever pull, but in the end, we ended up going with a player interact where you're trying to push off the broken piece of the ship. Here, we're trying to get a sense of the timing of the VFX, that mist that's coming up along the floor and, and sliding over to reveal Zeus. It is time, my son. Following the mist over to the hallucination Kratos. And with this previous, we were able to quickly test whether this transition from third-person camera to first-person camera was going to work. And back to third-person. <laughs> Avieni, everybody. <laughs> he was great. Very bewildered Atreus. And back to our first-person camera. We gotta go. Oh, never mind. Look. And back to third person. And when Dory realized that this was going to work, we all got really excited, and it was it was great to be able to see it this early in our previous production process. There, there's our barrels rolling down the street. Jump. This also let us quickly figure out and how many takes we were going to have to shoot on stage. You can see right there we cut, and that was going to be the end of the first part. And then we would do the second part of the landing with some hand keyed stuff in the middle of the scene. And up you guys go. That was your plan. They're both cracked. So for many scenes, the live action reference was actually enough previs to take directly to stage. But some were a little bit more complex, and we needed a way to actually visualize the game environment. So for this, we used rough motion capture, or mocap. We had the luxury of having our own Vicon space within our studio, but with Wonners, this actually became a necessity. So some of the benefits of that was that we could actually work with characters of varying sizes without having to shuffle around on our knees. We could see our actual sets and props to scale. We could get more accurate plans for our principal shoot days. We could figure out how many different mocap volumes we would need and figure out how we would divide up our environments to, to accomplish that. All of that data could then be sent over to the stage to prep for our shoot. 
and anything that we shoot could also be exported as a prototype to be put in the game engine. Some of the challenges of working with motion capture, of course, are learning to operate a mocap system. Blade is not the most user-friendly piece of software, and we would often have cameras issues getting all the cameras calibrated. Our virtual cameras monitor often shorted out due to cabling issues, so we had some hardware difficulties. Motion Builder was unstable with our plugins sometimes and tended to crash when we worked with a very large scene. So stuff like that. It was also a much slower iteration time than live action previs because you had to set up the volume, you had to get the animator suited up, we had to shoot the thing, we had to tear it down, then we had to assemble the scene, then we had to render it. Whew. So it was a little more, more difficult to iterate quickly, at least a one day turnaround just to shoot it. It tended to divert our animators away because they were getting in the suit and shooting. And it was a lot of fun, but then they were spending time shooting instead of animating. When production ramped up significantly, we would hire temp actors to fill in those roles. But the concern was always that because the animator was not in the suit and, and in the moment with the previs process, they might have less creative input in their ownership of their scenes. So we were always concerned about that. We're thinking of maybe ways to involve the main owner of the, of the scene, but then hire temp actors to fill in the rest of the characters for the scene. Here are some examples of where we used rough motion capture for our previs. Sure hope you know what you're doing. Sure this scene was important because we needed to see the relationship yeah, of the table the water and, and the characters and, and the I mean location it. of the fireplace yeah. and the cauldron within her house. So we really just wanted to see where everything was and also figure out how Kratos was going to dunk the head in there. And you'll see in the rough mocap, uh, the arm was kind of obscuring him, so we opened up for the final shot. This was a test of how we might shoot some very large characters. We, we just marked up a cardboard box and puppeteered that guy around. Is a corruption of magic. This was important to actually see the environment, that face in the mountain, and figure out where we were going to place our characters in relation to the scene. It's everything. What is this going to so going back to flying boat jump again, this was our rough mocap previs. Zeus beat down, take one. This was shot pretty early uh, in the production of this scene, so you'll notice that the entrances and exits hadn't been figured out yet. You. Kratos is coming in from a me, strange father. location. Time to end this. Yes, my son. But really, the He's purpose time. of this test was to see how this composition would look with the two ghosts and the boat in the background, and having Atreus standing there, and, and was everything going to get too busy, or could we, could we frame it so it looked really nice? So we're, re we're really looking at this composition in particular. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the <laughs> things of having Vicon in your own studio is that everyone can hear you. Thank you! They were usually pretty good sports about it, though. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of business, which is basically giving your characters things to do. This is something movie folks understand pretty implicitly, but some, can sometimes be overlooked in games, especially when we just have so much content we have to crank out, you know, hours and hours of content. But again, when we had no cuts, it was very important to give our characters things to do because this gave us opportunities for the camera to look away from the characters. Again, we can't do cutaways, but having something for the camera to look at and motivate it to look away from the character's face was important. Business would also provide motivation for getting the characters to move through the space. And if you think back to our early tests where the characters were kind of freezing and that caused the camera to swing around and do weird stuff, giving them business helped move them. Finally, you could get a lot of nice nonverbal insights into a character's personality by giving them stuff to do. And this would help our actors get into character and stay in character throughout the, the scene and, and not worry about what to do with their body. So these are some examples of giving our characters business. You can see we put Freya up on a ladder and messing around with some herbs to help sell her character as a witch of the woods. And Sindri kind of freaking about, about carrying that gear, um, but really also selling his nature as a craftsman and being dedicated to his work. And his work is junk. Those things are accurate. Your point? Point? I just love the idea of Brock eating something, and I won't spoil where he got that meat from, but if you play the game, you will find out. I'm offering. Not what I was offering. Saw your brother again. I'd bow, I'd bow if I could, Your Majesty. This is an example of getting the character to move through the space by using business. We had all these cups and bowls and stuff on her table that she was using to cast her spell. You didn't know and she could go over there and, and we could work with that. When word gets out that Namir is free, the wrath of Odin won't be far behind. You're one of the gods. 
the Vanir once, yes. Leader of the Vanir no once, once, yes. And you did not but think no it important to you tell me? You did important to tell me. Here's an example of how we used a prop to do you know, something like that looks like a cutaway. You can quickly move down and look at the knife and then come back up. And, you're right then, and again, here we focus on Freya and then we're using the bowl to kind of create a new composition. Yeah, <laughs> Avi, everybody. <laughs> and using those effects to then draw the camera up to go up to Kratos. You may have noticed a big part of business is having props. And you know, Sony, Sony's main motion capture studio has an entire prop building department, but for previs, we're on our own. So we tended to gather whatever materials we could find from the mailroom, from trash cans, leftover items in the hallways, used lots of duct tape and created stuff like this. We've got our tree, we've got the big ogre, and some kind of deer. Sometimes we would use markers and marker up something like Mimir's head so that when we shot our rough mocap, we could see it in the mocap space. And finally, for those scenes where we literally could not humanly shoot the scene, we went back to traditional layout. The big benefit of this is you can do anything, so we could craft those big, super epic God of War moments. The challenge, of course, is that it is super time consuming to create and iterate on, and it's hard to establish real world timing because you're not physically doing the actions with your body. But let's take a look at some of the cool scenes we did. I have you. You can see how much the pose of the snake and the composition changed from the previous to the final. And also having Kratos pick up the axe with his other hands so he can keep it on frame, which is pretty important. This is great! All right, we have a small clip of traditional previous for the flying boat jump. And originally this was going to be almost a different scene entirely, so we had this whole moment where these icicles were gonna break down and break off the front part of the ship. But then the rest of it is pretty similar to what we ended up shooting and animating for the final product. We've got the barrels rolling down, or whatever that is. And then they crash. And an interesting thing to note here in the original previs is that Kratos jumps first, so it was, it was a cool change to have Atreus lead the way in the final version. All right, so once you've got your previs all done, you've got it approved, it is time to go on set. All right. On previous projects, we would sometimes do our set construction, our rehearsal, even our shoots, all on the same day. We didn't have a virtual camera because we were doing all the camera work in Maya. So there was a little bit of room for choreography experiments, letting the actors run around and see what they could you know, come up with. But again, no cuts means it's not really great to try improv. This scene was really the only time we were on stage and didn't have previs ready, so we just kind of winged it. And you can start to see some of the same failure points you we encountered in our early tests. What is it, boy? Some very unmotivated camera motions because the actors had frozen and Dory needed to go and see their faces, so we just kind of swung around to try to get their reactions. And then we had to swing back around because we had to get back to game camera. So there wasn't really any motivation for that move either. But we wanted to see Atreus's face and we needed to get back no. to the game. In the end, this data, I don't know, we just didn't like it. So we ended up throwing it out. And we did a proper previous pass and we came back to the stage later. It also helped to have more context for where the scene was taking place. And it was taking place Again, in a boat. I said nothing. All right, hey, let's shoot some previews for the boat. What is it, boy? You can see here we were able to figure out how to get the actors to says, face the camera. You don't hear that? Dory was able to do some more thinking about how he wanted to do the lensing. It's going away now. And we would do a zoom in and get a really screaming. nice intimate shot here. Lots of voices, angry. You really didn't hear that? No. Yeah, this nice moment with them. It felt... Evil. And then we could use the motion of Atreus turning to sit back down on the boat as motivation for the camera to move and get back into the camera. So again, every scene had to be meticulously planned. So no more winging it on the set, have previs every single time.
another big aspect of not winging it was breaking up our mocap shoots and having a specific tech day. So no actors on set, just the animators and, and Dory and everybody who needed to be there to review our exported data and our videos from the previous process with the stage crew, discussing and reviewing any props we would need for the shoot day, dividing up our volume space, figuring out what sets we wanted to construct, laying down tape for all our major choreography beats, and this was useful when we had our mocap previews, we could actually measure that in Motion Builder and get that all down. And finally, just go over our shot list, finalize any last minute details so that when the actors showed up, they were ready to go and we could just start rehearsing. Now getting those assets to the stage for Tech Day posed a little bit of a challenge, and that's where we had our tech artists give us an assist. They wrote a tool for us which we called the Maya to Motion Builder tool, and that allowed our animators to export our proprietary animation rigs into Motion Builder at the correct scale and orientation, and we didn't need to bake anims or anything, so that saved us a lot of time. One of the big pain points, however, was exporting our environments into Motion Builder. See, on our project, we use a proprietary thing called ref nodes, which are similar to like Unity prefabs, and those needed to be converted to regular geometry in order to be compatible with Motion Builder. And this was a very slow process. I mean, there's just hundreds or thousands of assets in just this one piece alone, the house. That converted geo then needed to be parented under a node so that it could be moved from world space to the mocap space, which is like that green space there at the origin, and then back again after the shoot. And this was all done by hand, so there was lots of room for human error, especially when onboarding new team members. So we're now developing an automation tool similar to Maya to Motion Builder, but for converting environment geometry. Once we're on the set, there were quite a few people there. We had our creative director, of course, our writers, our director of photography was there, the animation director was there, the animation lead was there, our producers were there, our dialogue coordinator, the stage crew, and animators. Whew. Lots of cooks in the kitchen. So it was very important to define roles on the set so the actors weren't getting overwhelmed by feedback coming from too many directions. What we ended up doing was having our creative director or writers focus with the actors on their performance notes. Our director of photography would focus on staging notes, and our animation director would focus on any kind of body mechanics notes. So if anybody else had feedback to give for any of these things, they, they could go to our point people and give them the feedback and then they could relay it to the actors so the actors knew who to go to when they needed feedback. And what would the animators do on set? Ooh, we could use them as stage hands. Again, they were owning their scenes so they know it and they know all the elements within it so they really were helpful in being able to present the previous videos and talk through it. They could inform other people about any entrances, exits, key poses, props that were needed. They could assist with any stand-in work, any kind of extra bodies needed that we didn't have anybody suited up for. And of course, they were taking notes on any info coming out of the shoot so that when they got the data back, they were ready to hit the ground running. Here's a few examples well, of animators as stagehands well, here. Well, I'm uh, playing a dead body. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you can see our creative director, writers, and our dialogue coordinator no! in the back, making sure everything's running long smoothly. Long. <laughs> This is a scene that actually got cut from the game, but I had a lot of fun playing this creature in the water, and then our stage crew did an awesome job building this boat for us that could move around and, and act like it was on the water. Oh! Sit down. This is not a game. Here you can see our boat rig being used for a more intense okay. scene. This is the introduction of Jormungandr, the giant world serpent coming out of the water. And I'd like to take this moment to talk a little bit about multiple motion capture spaces. And I'm gonna pause it here, and you can see we've got our main actors in the boat here, and you've got me in the corner, and what the heck am I doing with this little thing here? It's kinda of hard to see, but you can see a monitor of what Dory's seeing through his virtual camera, and here's Kratos and Atreus, and we've got this giant snake. Now obviously we couldn't build a giant snake, it wouldn't fit in the mocap space. So what we used was a tiny little box with markers on it, and I was acting as sort of a puppeteer of the snake. And then we would take that data and offset it in real time so that from Dory's point of view, he could see the snake in the right place. And then this little green spot being held by Bruno, our animation director, was being held up so that the actors would know where to look to represent where the snake would be. Whew, a little complex, but we made it work. All right, here we've got some onset footage from the flying boat jump. Since this was a pretty physical uh, scene, we ended up using stunt actors. 
Here we have one of our, our stunt actors acting as Kratos, and he would also double as the ghost Kratos. And you might see Dory over there kind of offset. He, we wanted to keep him out of the way of the stunt actor so he would not get punched in the face. And also, it, it allowed him to get in and really get that first person camera without interrupting the actors. So he's being offset as well. Like I mentioned, when we did our live action previews, we were going to break it up into multiple pieces. So we'll see the second take where we've got our observers. We've got a stunt stand in for Sunny as Atreus. Okay, coming in close. And then we've got Kratos in the back there. What the hell's that? And since we had already shot the data for the ghost, we could see that within the virtual Come camera. On, we gotta go. Cut. There's no time. Look. We hadn't animated the barrels yet, so we just kind of Lodge. pretended. And go. I got a plan. Jump. And then here's where we cut, and we go to cut. the traditional cut. animation for the big cool. fall, and then we have our final take where they land, and you know the rest of that scene. Now what is your plan? All right. So after everything is done and shot, it's time to get all that data back and assemble it and polish it. And the first part of that is editing. I know what you're thinking. What? Editing? Why are you editing a one -er? It's all one shot. Well, we tried to avoid editing as often as possible because it's exponentially more difficult to blend two takes together versus cutting. But sometimes you have to account for multi-volume scenes for very large environments. Sometimes you have to think about unintentional mistakes that might have happened on set. Maybe you're getting a really good take, but then there's just one line that the actor flubs, so you want to just do a little insert there where they get the line right, and then you'll just merge those two bests together. Sometimes we need inserts for clarity or script rewrites. Occasionally, we'd have a play test where the players would give feedback that they didn't understand what was going on, so we might do some rewrites and, and shoot something to help clarify that scene. Also, timing passes. In case a scene was running long or needed some extra time, we would insert or cut things down. <laughs> cut, yeah. Also, any changes to level design or environment art, like you, you saw in, in the mocap previs, we hadn't figured out the entrances or exits. So sometimes, once we nailed that down, we would do a quick reshoot and get those entrances nailed down and blend that all together. Challenges of editing. editing. We had some limitations with Maya because blending takes together is hard. We weren't having too much luck with the tracks editor, so what we ended up doing was using Motion Builder's story tool, which let us edit pretty quickly and get some macro edits going. And then once we were happy with the rough timing, we could then work on anim layers and constraints. Now there's a bit of an art to choosing where to edit. You're trying to find the best blend. And what you're looking for is character position and pose, whether they match pretty closely across two different takes. Of course, also the camera position. Again, because we're not cutting, you need to make sure the camera's in a pretty safe place so that you're not getting some weird motion once you're going between the two takes. It's a bonus if your carriages are off screen when you're doing the edit because then you don't have to worry about blending them together. Oh, let's take a look at our story tool for flying boat jump. Yeah, I know, it looks a little crazy. Let me break it down for you. These two tracks represent the ghost, Kratos, and Zeus. And what we were doing here was working and getting those punches looking really good and physical, so we did a bunch of edits for timing. Up here, we've got Atreus. This is about the moment when he pushes through the two ghosts, so we, oh no, why is my battery not? I'm sorry, let's plug that in. All right, here we go. <clears throat> this is where Atreus is pushing through the two ghosts. We wanted to make sure that felt very physical. Here, we actually ran out of data, so we were copying and pasting extra punches. Yeah. <laughs> And here we've got a little take of Atreus. This is probably an old screenshot, and they were probably going to insert that up here to help Atreus slide. And let's go ahead and play this shot, and you can watch it go along with it. Here's those physical punches. Here we've got Atreus's push through coming in. Extra punches, bam. and this take of Atreus sliding down. All right. 
some results of that. Of course, the ideal was always to get our scenes nailed down with one perfect take, but it ended up that over 50% of our cinematics needed major editing or reshoots or merges. And all of our cinematics required at least some minor edits to accommodate our finalized environments, make sure our pose were matching, etc. That's not a great track record. So how can we get that percentage down? Really what we need to do is focus on our tools and communication to make sure we have everything we need before we go on stage and after we go on stage to help us get our workflow more, moving more quickly. Oh yes, animation, it's time to do the fun stuff. It's time to animate those cool creatures and those crazy stunts and also the not so fun stuff like bandages and chains and ropes and vines and all those spline IK everybody loves to do, yeah. When you're using cuts, it's often simpler to compartmentalize your thoughts into smaller task chunks and focus on one shot at a time, such as this, you know, 150 frames, that's not too bad, you can keep track of what your curves are doing there. But with very long wonders like God of War had, the animators had to keep the entire scene in mind while they're making edits, because if you're working on a layer and you make a change and you forget that you made that change, it might ripple down the entire scene, so if you're not keeping track, hours of your work could get wrecked. The actual process of animating is the same as it's been for years, but the mental focus required grew quite a bit. So let's take a look at some of our awesome and keyed animation. Better look at. Oh. <laughs> I got to do that one. In between all my meetings and spreadsheets. Stay behind me and protect our flight. Yes, sir! And of course, our flying boat jump. All right. Some quick numbers about our animation team. We had an internal team size of about seven animators at peak production. We had three different outsourced teams, two vendors helping clean up our body and one vendor for facial solving. But our internal animators would have ownership of all the scenes, including our outsourced ones, so that they could assemble the outsourced data and make sure everything got integrated and keeping track of the debugging process. In hindsight, we wished we'd had a larger internal team because as our contractors rolled off, we would have to transfer ownership of all those scenes to all our remaining team members. And we had over 100 cut scenes to keep track of, so that was a lot. Also, just tracking the sheer amount of content and scope creep, we had a lot of level design asks that weren't originally in the script, but we would, you know, we would need to help tell the story of level design as well. So now we take into consideration all of our narrative moments and not just cinematics as we work out our scope and our schedule. Onto our polish, we had what we called the buttery smooth pack. And what this was was just really troubleshooting those seamless transitions between gameplay and cinematics to make sure our no-cut language was working. The main things we were looking for was pose matching, and that seems pretty obvious, but it's important to establish those standard poses, and any time it's changed, make sure you communicate them widely across the team. Make sure your pose lab library is updated, and see if you can find some tools that helps the animators match poses and animations across your scenes and characters. Matching the velocity of the gameplay animation into a cinematic and back out. Each of our characters had a zero joint that indicated their position in the game, and in the case of Kratos, the player, the camera is also attached to that zero joint, so any kind of errant motion was gonna cause some weird jarring camera blends. The zero joint's velocity also informs the engine of what state the character should be in, whether he's walking or running or idle. So if it's not matching the actual action of the scene, if you've animated your cinematic so Kratos is running out, but your zero joint is frozen, then the game engine thinks he's standing, so then you're gonna see him pop into an idle pose at the end of the scene. Finally, thinking about metrics, for any interactable objects such as doors or levers, we need to get those exact metrics set by the gameplay team for how close the player should be to that object at the start of a cinematic. Here are some issues with buttery smoothness. You can see this magical door. We hadn't figured out the metrics of where the player should stand, so you'll see Kratos actually walk backwards as he's starting the cinematic. Oh, or not. Let me do that again. Here we go. Yep. Whoop. Little lerp there. Still can't get the doors open, huh? Quiet. Here you can see some of our debugging tools. You can see there's a little arrow down here showing the velocity of the zero joint at any time. We're trying to debug why those pose matches are happening. 
this scene, you'll notice that the log and Kratos become out of sync. Oh, what's that sliding all about? Let's go into that debugging tool, and you'll see that at some point, the log's zero joint stopped moving, so it thought that it should not be moving forward, while Kratos kept walking along. So just taking care to do all of that buttery smoothness. Here are some issues with the flying boat jump. There was kind of a position misalignment and we didn't have any transitional motion to get the player into the place where they needed to be. So that. And also for some reason it wanted to play that part twice. I don't know. At the end, the, the lighting hadn't been put in yet, but you can see that there's a pose mismatch here between the normal idol and the combat idol. In this particular iteration, Kratos flew off into space and then, and then aligned up with the ship. The zero joint also, uh, if it wasn't in sync with the body, sometimes there were cloth physics problems because it thought that the character was somewhere else, so you would see his skirt would flip out there. And again, pose mismatches. This was uh, always the pops between the end of the cinematic and the gameplay. Here you might see the characters drop, drop down. That might be because IK or Collision's turning back on and we haven't quite aligned them to the ground plane, so we're trying to figure out where that's going. Another big part of polishing our scenes were armor variants. We, Kratos has many armors. And again, because we can't cut, we can't hide any armor swaps on a cut to get into our cinematics. Some problems with that were, of course, obstructing your face. We need to be able to see Kratos' face during certain cinematics, but certain pauldrons would obstruct it, and you know, that's troubling. Penetrations, we'd have stuff going into other parts of the body, other parts of the armor. This was a pretty extreme example. I don't think this was ever actually in any cinematic. <clears throat> Some solutions to this were making slight body adjustments to fix our penetrations. We could often cheat the camera so that if an offending object, uh, if from the camera view it doesn't look like it's um, penetrating, then it's resting properly on different armors, such as when he's resting his hand on his, on his bracers. From a specific camera angle, it looks fine. And when all of those fails, we plead with character art, can you please just adjust this pauldron a little bit so I don't have to deal with it anymore? Of course, there was one scene in particular that was a beast, and you might recognize this one. The rope. Are you not better? Kratos had to sling a rope over his I shoulder, guess. and we couldn't hide it. It's close up on the camera. My talk with Freya. All the pauldrons were clipping you through, you or it was floating above. And what were we going to do about this? Oh man, that's a tough one. What that tech art ended up doing was rigging up a rope for us with four different joint chains and four different rope meshes, and our animator placed them at different heights to cover the range of variation between our different shoulder pads. Then the integration team would script the visibility on each of those rope meshes to turn on and off depending on what the player had equipped at the time. Yes. <laughs> Why do you say nothing? Another thing here is our axe pommel. Sindri <laughs> rests his elbow on it, but this particular pommel had a blade. Oh man, okay. For this one, we just tweaked the animation to have Sindri wrap his arm around the blade and any other pommel, it still looked like he was resting his elbow on it. But our favorite one, and one we probably got the most bugs for, were what we lovingly called the Kratos nip slip. What is that? <laughs> yeah. That was an easy fix. You just rotate the clavicle a little bit, but just, it happens so many times. We got so many bugs about that. There we go, fixing all the bugs. All right, let's wrap it up. So although we encountered many challenges on the path to realizing this vision of a no-cut narrative language, Overall, we felt our new pipeline helped us achieve success. Our final cinematics looked pretty close to our previs, even when it was shot in live action. And we were able to create smooth blends between gameplay and cinematics. So let's take one more look at the flying boat jump and the many pieces that came to cre together to create it. It is time, my son. Look around at what you have done. Ah! <laughs> 
Come on, we gotta go! You saw. There's no time, look! Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> we have some time for Q&A, so we've got a couple microphones here if you want to come up and ask me any questions. Anybody? All right. Hi. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I'm Christian. Um, so I had a question, two questions. One, did you guys use VCAM um, like all the way through to the final cutscenes? Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Well, when we shot live action reference, we wouldn't have the VCAM. We would just be using an SLR. But anytime mm. we were using rough mocap and, and on the stage, we would always have a virtual camera on set. Yes. Yeah. Did did the the virtual camera actually help you guys translate what you were doing with the VCAM to the the final cutscene you would get in the game? Yes, I mean, the data was being recorded from the virtual camera, and then mm -hmm. Dory could take that, and, and he and the cinematic artist would take that data, and they, they would do some cleanup by hand in Motion yeah. Builder to get the final look and do some minor adjustments here and there, but the, the raw data from the virtual camera was always the baseline for that. Cool, mm -hmm. and then um, as far as studio-wise, like, do you guys enjoy this process of, with the motion capture of the VCAM? And will you use it again on future projects? I think it's a lot of fun. I think now that we've got our pipeline set up, it's definitely a tool we can use in our pocket whenever we can. It's really helped streamline our previous process and helping us iterate as quickly as possible. So it's definitely something I want to keep using, yeah. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Hey, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, another question about VCAM. Uh, can you tell, uh, like, say something quickly about uh, this deciding between uh, like shooting VCAM with the actors on stage or shooting it offset from the actors or shooting it separately? Uh, most of the time we would try to keep the virtual camera in lockstep with the actors in actual space. Uh, for Flying Boat Jump it was just an issue of Dory really wanted to get into the, the shot he wanted for the first person thing, so that's what he requested an offset, so he didn't have to be like right on top of the stunt actors while they were doing their stunts. But most of the time, the camera and the actors were in the actual space we wanted them to be in. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, are you using a facial capture, are you using Motion Builder story mode to blend both facial capture and body capture together? Uh, the question was, were we using Motion Builder also for the facial capture? Yeah. No, uh, we did mostly body cleanup in, in Motion Builder, and then uh, we would do all of the facial cleanup and, and pasting in Maya. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then um, also, um, what was the frames per second when you're m making the cinematics in Maya or Motion Builder? Uh, we would shoot at 30 frames per second. Yeah. Thank you. Right, thank you again for, for the talk. It was super informative. Um, how much of the team came from more of like a cinema background and how much interplay was there between cinema and games and what kind of challenges from the game side versus maybe a more cinema side that did you have to kind of consider? Mm -hmm. Um, for our animators, we, we tried to hire specifically for cinematics, so people, if they hadn't gone through film school or anything, that they at least worked in cinematics on previous games. But our real rock star was Dory Arazi. He comes from film and he's done a bunch of stuff and he had the eye for doing it, so he was really driving the look and feel of our scenes. Hi. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about uh, why you created the tool for Maya and Motion Builder? I'm a little more familiar with like Motion Builder and Maya, but 
Yeah, uh, uh, because mo most of the time we're animating in Maya, all the gameplay animators work in Maya and all of our rigs are set up to work with Maya and we have several tools and just the way that the rigs are built to work with those tools, it makes it a little more proprietary and harder to translate directly into Motion Builder one for one. So the tool was just a way to get those proprietary nodes kind of stripped out and, and locked down and putting it into Motion Builder. And it also goes both ways. So we would go then from Motion Builder once we cleaned up back into Maya and back onto our proprietary rig so we could keep working. Okay. So like easier for pose mashing and uh, yeah. in Motion Builder. Well, and also our rigs in Maya are at a different scale. They're not one-to-one -one in uh, meters or, or whatever. So we would have to scale everything up when we brought it into Motion Builder and scale it back down when we came to, into Maya. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a question because I noticed that the stunt was a woman and the main actor for uh, Atreus was a, a child mm -hmm. and did have some trouble with the difference of the performance. This is the first question. Right. The second one is Atreus' actor, main actor is a child, so I would like to know if you had a problem with because the child is growing up really fast and during the shooting it Mm. Could be a problem because of <laughs> yes, the, the question was about the challenges of working with child actors versus a stunt actor who was an adult. Yeah, uh, I mean, as much as possible, we tried to use Sonny. Uh, occasionally, he would have to be in school for certain hours, so we would bring in a stand-in while he was in school. And we would try to hire actors who could mimic the, the motions of a child as much as possible. But of course, there, there is advantages of using an actual child actor. You, it does look a little different. So we would then have the animators kind of try to match the data across and try to create a, a consistent workflow. Um, as for Sunny growing throughout the production process, that, that was a concern. Uh, it didn't affect us too much. He did grow an inch or two, but it, was, it wasn't enough to cause a, a big problem for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Before I let, oh, yep, go ahead. Hi, one last question. Um, great talk. Um, you mentioned cinematic artists, I believe, doing mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, how big was that team? How many, how many people? Um, I mean, Dory was doing a lot of work, and then he was able to bring in a second person to help him out. Uh, we had a third person who was helping out with the V-cam on set, and then the, the other one was focused mainly on motion builder cleanup. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my question maybe would have been better for Dory, but like maybe you can help me out with it because I was wondering with the single cuts, like with the no cut um, directing that you had, like mm -hmm. that tends to be kind of exhausting for long periods of time, like as a as a spectator. Yes. So oh, like, what did um, like? How did you guys like sort of make it so that you could actually play the game for the, you know? the way people play, which is several hours generally, if you can, like you get into the story and not have you be exhausted by the time you're finished. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dory's right there, you can come talk to him afterwards, but I think it, it's just about having, yeah, <laughs> having enough interesting things happening on the stage and, and making sure that the staging is very interesting and the characters are moving around and, and having things to do to, to keep the eye going, and, and as for viewer fatigue, yeah, I guess Dory might be the guy to answer Yeah, that because, that like, that's mostly because I'm thinking, you know, um, for example, in The Haunting of Hill House, they have that one episode that's just no cuts for, like, 20 minutes, and by the time you finish, you, you just want to die. It's exhausting <laughs> and depressing and very sad, so, like... Yeah. I, it might be that once you're back in gameplay, you feel like you're in control again, so right. maybe that helps alleviate some of that as well. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Just before I let you go, we are hiring. We have many positions open, so make sure you check out our website. You can come talk to me, leave business cards, especially animators, if you have what it takes. Uh, come see me. Or I think we have a recruiting booth downstairs, but uh, yeah. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>